and I'm sharing for you as a community. So the theme that we've been given is, is having a hunger to grow. And so there's a hunger that we want for ourselves, that we want to be people who are hungry for God. We want to be people who are growing in, in a, a passion for Jesus and the things of Jesus. But we also want to be people who help others have a hunger for God. If you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, how do you help your non-worshipping grandchildren to have a hunger for God? How do you help a spouse who has given up on the things of Jesus to have a hunger for God? How do you, as a community of people, a faith community, a, a church family, how do you have as one of your core values that we are a people who have a hunger for God? So I'm speaking on two levels. One is for you as an individual, and one is for you as part of a community. As we begin, and I reflect on this theme, having a hunger for God, there's a phrase that comes from uh, a couple who work in Mozambique, Heidi and Roland Baker. They work with IRIS Ministries. IRIS is an acronym for something that I've since forgotten. Roland says, the hungry will always be fed. He said, when we go out with food, out to the villages, he said, the hungry will always be fed. They are the ones who push to the front. They are the ones who will climb over other people. They were the ones who will chase the truck, or meet the truck even before it gets to the village, and they'll chase the truck once it goes out of the village. The hungry will always be fed. So it's not my job to feed you today. But what I do want to do is help create in you a, a hunger and a passion so that you feed yourself. So that you're the person who's at the foot of the truck going, I want food before anyone else. I mean, understand my illustration. This isn't about at the exclusion of others. But that you're responsible for your own spiritual growth. You're responsible for your own spiritual journey. Now, I want you to turn to the person next door and say, you're awesome. We've got a few people agreeing. Actually, before, before I go into that, um, if you haven't got notes or you haven't got a phone out where you can take notes, you, you may need to jot some things down because in your discussion groups, I, I, I'm not a fan of academic discussion. I don't want anyone in the discussion groups to go, oh, he was a really gifted speaker or oh, he mumbled a lot or I couldn't understand what he said. That, that's, that's evasive discussion groups and it doesn't bring transformation to anyone. So the things I would like you to discuss, and if you get into groups of six, you may find that six is too many. It may be one-on-one. -on -one. What's your name? Rod. Rod. It may be Rod and me for a start. And if you've got six, so let's, let's try and have groups that don't have odd numbers. It may not always be able to happen. So that even in your groups, you can get into a pair and firstly do this in the pairs and then share the overflow of your pair sharing with the group. So what one thing impacted me most for my life personally? So not out of what I say, but what Holy Spirit prompts in you, what's one thing that you're going to hear that's impacted you most for your life personally? What will this mean for me? Are there any steps I'm called to take? Uh, secondly, what challenged or impacted me for our church family? And how will I or we be different as a church family as a result? So... I've said you're awesome. That's because the talk is going to centre around the word or. When I can get this out. Not complaining, but this is why headsets are really nice. We're going to look at some ores. So that's the kind of awesome I'm talking about. The first thing in developing a hungry for God hunger for God, do we want delegated Christianity or an empowered that was a comma by the way personalised faith
Do we want delegated Christianity or an empowered, personalised faith? When I say personalised faith, I don't mean a faith that is so personal it never finds expression to anyone else. But there are two things. Firstly, my faith is sustained. My relationship with Jesus is sustained by the corporate faith. On the days when I can't believe, there's nothing better than getting together in your lounge room or on a Sunday morning with other believers because the faith of the community sustains my faith. That's the great thing about being in a family. It's a great thing about being part of a community. But having said that, I can't live forever on the faith of other people. Because there will be a day when someone else needs my faith. And if I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, if I'm not growing in a hunger for God, then I've got nothing to give anyone else. Now, what are we talking about here? Let me explain a few things. There's a huge difference between delegation and empowerment. A huge difference. If you've only worked for bad managers, you will never know the difference. Delegation in the corporate world or in tasks is where I, as the leader, work out an outcome that I would like, work out the tasks or the steps that are necessary for that outcome to be achieved, and then I give them to you to carry out. That's delegation. I've worked the outcome. I've deduced the tasks. Here, I delegate them to you to carry out. My, my thesis is this. People rarely grow under delegation. Because I'm not owning the outcome. I've had no say in it. I'm not responsible for it. Uh, the tasks are according to someone else's personality, someone else's gifting, someone else's passion, someone else's competency. And so I'm only doing something because someone else has asked me to do it. And it's a killer of joy. And it's a robber of enterprise. And it's the way many churches are run. The hierarchical. They're run by someone who works out a plan or a program and then delegates it to you and your job is to faithfully attend, faithfully give and faithfully follow the dictates of the leadership of the community. It's a delegated Christianity. And then we wonder why there's a ceiling. And do you know what the ceiling is? Do you know what the lid is? The lid is the faith of the leader. You know, it's like being in a, a wheelie bin and you want to grow beyond a wheelie bin, but you can't because that's the environment you've been put in. Empowerment is where, um, if Rod, isn't it? Yeah. So I get together with Rod and together Rod and I look at the situation before us. Together Rod and I work out an outcome that is going to be good for the community or the family. And then because I, because I trust Rod, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing this with him if I didn't trust him. Because I trust Rod, because I respect Rod, because Rod's got gifts and competencies, I say, Rod, we have this agreed outcome. Go. The world's your oyster. And so Rod then goes away and he works out the steps or the tasks according to his personality, his gifts, his competencies, his strengths, his passions, his way of being. I'm a resource. Anything you need, come and see me. Anything you want, I'll see if I can provide it for you. You need a budget? Here it is. You need more budget? Here it is. And if he asks for it, I'll usually give it to him. Why? Because I trust him. That's empowerment. Christians grow best and faith grows and hunger grows in a culture and an atmosphere of empowerment. You know, one of the worst things that happens is when uh, a senior pastor of a mega church discovers a new truth and he preaches it in a sermon series and then the sermon series is taken by one of their staff members and put into a book. You know, don't think that Bill Hybels or Rick Warren have the time to write books. I've got the time to write messages. But then some editor takes it and puts it in a book and they put out the book and it goes to Kurong and you and I go in there and go, oh, you know... Um, Bill Johnson's written this. I'll buy it. But you see, Bill Johnson's got this personality and these habits in his life, and you're over here and you've got this personality and your habits in life, and so you now start to adopt 
the things that Bill Johnson says you should do or it'd be good to do, and after three weeks you get frustrated and you give up and you think, I'm useless. I've tried this before. It never seems to work. You're not useless. You're not hopeless. You've just been cutting and pasting. You've been living with a delegated Christianity. The Holy Spirit knows nothing about delegation. I've just written a third book um, called Spirited, which will come out in about three months' time, about ordinarily spectacular everyday life in the Holy Spirit. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is, is, is such a genius because he knows every single one of us. There, there's, not, there's not a personality that is alike in this room. That means you can't have a Bible reading program that's alike. It means you don't all like the same books. It means you don't all respond the same way. Um, it means worship leaders, they're not against you when they don't all sing the songs the, that you like. It's just that you like those songs, they like listening to hymns. Um, you know, we, we, we respond in different ways and the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us is an absolute genius in connecting with us. He's the ultimate empowerer. Now, the beautiful thing would be to have Jesus face to face with us. You know, instead of having sticks, Peter speaking, um, it would be good to have Jesus here. <laughs> Jesus, you know, I just had a revelation yesterday when I was uh, having my Bible reading from Luke chapter 6 that Jesus called his disciples together this is in Luke. And out of the disciples, he chose 12. Ah, right. I thought from other chapters, he chose the 12. And they became his disciples. No, there were a group of disciples. And out of them, he chose 12, whom he called apostles. Why? Because you can't father every single person. You know, 12 is probably the maximum that you can do at one time. So, so he takes these 12 and he gives them everything he's got from the Father. So not everyone got access to Jesus in the same way the 12 did. And then he throws himself into the 12 for three years and then near the end he says to them, by the way guys, um, I'm out of here. Uh, I have to go. But when I go, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. But I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. Now he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. At the end of Luke chapter 24 and at the beginning of Acts chapter 1, he calls the Holy Spirit the promise of the Father. Because as Jesus has fathered these 12 disciples into the heart of the Father, because one of the themes through John's Gospel is Jesus only ever did that which he saw the Father doing. He wasn't needs responsive. He was Father hearing and Father responsive. He said, uh, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth, and he will lead you into all truth. Everything you've seen me do and heard me do, the Holy Spirit will do. In fact, when you get the Holy Spirit, you get something better because right now I'm speaking to you, the Holy Spirit's going to come and live inside of you. You see, if Jesus had stayed, now we know that in China at the moment there's close to one and a half billion people. India's got about 1.1 .1 or 1.2. If Jesus was to do a 50,000 seat stadium, you know, every day of the year, there'd be a whole another nation of China born by the end of the first year and he'd only got through one country. So he said, I can't do what I'm doing with you guys forever. I've done it with you guys, but now I have to go so through my spirit I can come back and do what I'm doing with you inside everyone. That's empowerment. Where you and I say, I've got to stay small group leader. I've got to stay band leader. I've got to stay youth leader. I've got to stay, um, you know, ministry team leader. Jesus says the opposite. He says to his disciples, guys, I've got to go. We say, I've got to stay. I'm indispensable. Jesus says, I've got to go. Because Jesus trusts the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers. The Holy Spirit relates to every single human being. And unless you grab hold of this, then you won't be leading anyone else into their own hunger for God, but they will be feeding at your bosom. They will be forever dependent on you. And likewise with you. You don't need to copy anyone else. You are you. You're unique. You're beautiful. You're brilliant. You're shaped in a certain way. 
And so the invitation is for you to find the way that you're shaped. You know, I know a person who, who reads one Bible verse a week. He doesn't memorize it, but he, well, he reads a short passage. And out of that passage, he picks one Bible verse, and that's his Bible verse for the week. He writes it out in a card, puts the card in his wallet and takes it with him. Every now and then he pulls it out. That's his quiet time. Uh, I know other people who read four or five chapters a day. Now you tell me which one's right, the one verse a week or the five chapters a day? Yeah, is more better? Who's getting more of the word? Well, if you read my orange book back there, you'll find in chapter four I tell you about how to soak scripture, observation, application, prayer. But in chapter 11, I tell you how I turned soap into a stairway to heaven and thought God was impressed because I got through to May one year without missing a day. Four chapters of the Bible a day. Victory, winner. And God says, Peter, stop reading. The Holy Spirit actually stopped me reading the Bible for about six weeks because he said, I have to detox you from thinking you're impressing me by the amount of your reading. So we're not after an amount we're after a relationship we're after intimacy find out who you are how you work and grow in the word according to who you are it's empowerment delegated christianity or empowerment we're in trouble if i spent that long on, on that one this next one's very simple because it follows on from what i've said meat or milk I can't remember which of my books is in. Um, I think it's in the orange one. A friend of mine, Craig Kirkby, he's actually my editor. Uh, he was a senior pastor of a large congregation in South Africa before the Holy Spirit told them to get their hands off the bride, off his bride. They had turned it into a business and a corporation. The Holy Spirit said, I don't like that. So they dismantled the congregation and sent them into smaller communities of faith. Anyway... Craig was shaking hands with a man after the service and the man came up and he said, wow, you know, that was a great message today. He said, you really, you really fed me meat today. And Craig reflected and said, yeah, it was one of those sermons where he'd said, you know, in the Greek, this word means such and such. And so he'd used a few intellectual phrases and the man said, you know, wow, you really gave us meat today. And Craig reflected and he said, well, actually, today I gave you milk. The man said, no, 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 it was a deep sermon. You, you gave me meat. He says, well, actually, it was milk. The man said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, Craig said, well, see, like a cow, choose the grass. He said, I studied the word. I chose the text. I studied the word. I chewed the word. I, I ruminated on the word. The word of God became part of me. It became part of my system. And so today, what was happening as you were listening to me, you got what I had been ruminating on. In the bovine world, we call that milk. I chew, you as the calf come, feed from me, you get milk. But whenever you study something for yourself, whenever you learn something for yourself, you get meat. So Alan, you get great milk around here. But when you study the word for yourself, you get meat. When you meet with another bloke or another girl, or when you ring someone up on the phone and say, guess what I discovered? So we've stayed, we stayed for a few days uh, just recently um, at our daughter's place and then we visited some people who have got a, a, a small church community near Walla Walla. And I went for a run one day and I was listening to, uh, I was, what day was that? I was listening to Luke chapter 3 uh, just a couple of days ago. And I had a revelation and it was such a deep, re I, I'd go off track if I was giving you the revelation. Julie wasn't around. I hopped on the phone to my mate Robin, who's a spray contractor in South Australia. I said, Robin, guess what? <laughs> and so I shared with Robin my revelation. It took me about two or three minutes. I said, it is all about sonship. And Robin goes, wow, what verse was that again? I said, oh, it doesn't matter. It's in Luke chapter 3 somewhere. He said, no, tell me so I can look at it. I said, well, if you want to look it up, you'll find it. I'm out running. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew from what I listened to and from what the Holy Spirit showed me. But I grew even more as I shared it with Robin. Then Robin's going to grow and Robin's going to go and look it up for himself. I wasn't going to give him the verse and the number. That's sharing meat. You can do this. You can do this. If you think you can feed off him once a week, what, what, what drinks milk? 
babies from the bosom. Yeah, babies. So, yeah, don't carry the image too far, otherwise you'll get freaked out. But, um, you know, you, you're not, you're not going to feed off this bloke forever. What, he's, what he does is empowers you guys, because I know his heart and he's an empower, and, and the other leaders in your community, they empower you to become... It should be the other way around, shouldn't it? Mm. Yes. <laughs> uh, you get the idea. Okay. Unless someone... I'll fix it up later if someone's going to take a shot of it. Okay. Thanks, Julie. Oh, do you want, here's my hand. Milk. By meat over there, you get your own meat. Ease or struggle. Now, I've only been here since last night, but already in three conversations, one at breakfast this morning and two last night, I've heard from people about how their faith is growing in struggle. I mean, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, is it? Or as one of my friends says, it's not rocket surgery. You and I avoid struggle like the plague, and so we should. Who wants to stick their hand up for struggle? And yet, that's when the hunger for God really grows. Um, someone asked me the other day, what's, what's your next book? If you've written one on spirit or spirited, what's your next one? I said, I think it's going to be about the freedom journey about finding grace in the wilderness, that God leads the children of Israel out of slavery through the wilderness and into the promised land. What if the wilderness is one of God's favourite places for us? You know, in Luke chapter 4, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And then Jesus was sorely tempted, was hungry, without food for 40 days and 40 nights, and then... It says he comes out of the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. Now, if someone said to you, do you want to be full of the Holy Spirit? You go, amen, brother. Is that right? 40 days fast starts now. I didn't mean it that much. I wasn't being serious. Yeah, a hunger for God grows in the times of struggle. And in the times of ease, uh, the times when we, uh, we sort of coast. I was... Um, I've already said that I, I like running. I'm not saying you have to run. When I give running examples or illustrations of running, it's because that's something that's significant in my life. But I was running up some hills around where I live one day and I was thinking, gee, I hate these hills. And uh, we live in a place called Mount Torrens. It's not a real mount, but everything's undulating. And I'm thinking, but it's only these hills that are getting me fit. So I don't like them, but boy, they're good for me. Uh, it's the struggle, it's the adversity that makes us stronger. I was listening to um, a gardening talkback show and they were talking about the drought and they said, uh, or the, the, dry in, the dry season in South Australia from a vineyard perspective and they said, we won't get the quantity of grapes that we normally get, but the quality is going to be exceptional. And there are, there are some great vines in South Australia where they'll advertise that these, these are only God-fed, God-watered, sorry. There's no other irrigation. And uh, they're, they're all the top quality wines. They're top dollar and top quality. Why? Because of the adversity, the struggle, that we don't know that a sprinkler is going to come on at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. It sends their, their roots down deep. And so struggle or adversity, I'm not saying stick your hand up now and saying, God, give me some struggle. Here's the invitation. Let's grow a hunger for him in the normal so that in the struggle our roots are down deep. Otherwise, God will love you so much that he may bring adversity so that the, struggle, so that the roots do go down deep. But uh, it's, it's in the struggle that, that we grow strong. You, you can all have an illustration. In fact, that's probably a good thing to share in your discussion times. Where, where have been, what have been some of the struggles in my life that have caused me to grow stronger? Another one. 
statements or questions. A friend of mine said uh, that he used to think that life was all about the exclamation mark, but as he's got older and matured, he realises that life is more about the, ec the, the question mark than the exclamation mark. You see, when I teach like this from up the front, I have to make exclamation marks because otherwise I'm wasting your time and mine. But when we get into our small groups and when we get into our pairs and when we do life with each other, if you just have another person who constantly makes exclamation marks to you, it's, it's not only boring, but it's actually patronising. It's about question marks, because it's the question marks that take us deeper. And of course, question marks are followed by space. Meditating, Christian meditation, not Eastern meditation, Christian meditation is about question marks. You'll hear about that from Julie in uh, the, her elective on hearing the voice of God. You'll probably hear about it from me in one of my later sessions. But um, in the, the green book over there, Favoured, you know, the angel comes to Mary and says, Greetings, Favoured One, the Lord is with you. And it said, But Mary was greatly perplexed by this and pondered in her heart what this might mean. Question marks lead to pondering. When you make an exclamation mark, there's no pondering. It's usually, I know it, exclamation mark. I've said it, exclamation mark. I've declared it, exclamation mark. That's the end of it, exclamation mark. You shut yourself off from growth. You shut yourself off from an adventure. People say to me, Peter, where do you get the teaching from that you teach? I say, I ask questions. I read a scripture, or when I'm out running, I listen to a scripture, and I ask questions. My revelation that came the other day that I rang my mate about was uh, when Jesus had been baptised by John, the Baptist, and it said that while Jesus was praying, heaven was open. Well, I teach that, in fact, uh, the whole central central section of the Orange Book is about the Father heart of God, and it happens when Jesus is baptised, and the Heavenly Father says, this is my son, my beloved, and I'm well pleased with him. And my whole thesis is that this is before Jesus has done anything. You know, he hasn't done any miracle, called any disciples. So here I am running the other day, listening to Luke chapter 4, uh, Luke chapter 3, and it said, after Jesus had been baptised and while he was praying, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, he did do something. What if there's a group of Christians who are going to say, ah, the prerequisite is, when you are praying, God will reveal his father heart. You don't have his father heart because you haven't been praying. So, so when I finished listening to Luke chapter 3, I said, Jesus, please show me, tell me, what were you praying about? I don't, I don't only want to know, but I need to know. And all these things came up in my mind. I came to, was he, were you praying about this, Jesus? Were you praying about this? Were you praying about this? Were you praying about that? <laughs> and I came to the conclusion that Jesus was praying, Father, show me show me where I fit. Show me where I belong. I'm, I'm 30, and I know you've called me here to be baptized by John. Show me what you want to do. And the next thing the Father shows him is, you're my son. And you know how Luke chapter 3 finishes? With the genealogy. <laughs> And this is so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. And so-and-so, -and -so, the son of so-and-so. So-and-so, the son of so-and-so. That's where you fit Jesus. And it finishes up with the son of Adam, the son of God. Ah, Jesus, you fit because you're the son of God. And then heaven is open. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And Jesus hears the Father say, you're my boy. I love you. How did I get that? Because I asked a question. You can do this. You know, it's okay to read Light for the Day. It's okay to read Oswald Chambers. It's okay. You know, that orange book over there, you can read a chapter in four minutes. I encourage, the, not the orange one, the green one. I encourage you to grow into a life of favour. But, but, but basically, I encourage you to ask questions of the Holy Spirit. Ask questions. You know, we were talking this morning in the, in the prayer time about, what was it? Taking off the washing and in the maths test. Maybe not in the maths test, but taking off, off the washing off the line and folding the washing. What a, what a mundane task. What a great place to ask God a question. If there's something you don't understand, you can ask him anytime. And you don't have to get the answer in the same moment you ask the question. But I can guarantee you this. One thing will give you a hunger for God more than anything else, and it's asking him questions. One thing will grow a passion 
for Jesus more than anything else, and it's asking him questions. So here am I at Will's place. Will is a church planter in Adelaide, Will and Nicky, and I'm a spiritual father to him. I like that better than mentor, because mentor is an imparting of information. Will doesn't need information from me. He needs someone to believe in him as he's on this journey. That's what a dad does, believes in his kids. So I'm a, I'm a dad to Will, and uh, I was down there, and we'd finished our, our time. Nicky was in the room, his wife, and I said, what's the time? And he told me, and I realised I had 15 minutes, I had a 20-minute journey to be at an appointment in 15 minutes' time. And I couldn't let this bloke wait. So I said, um, I've got to go. But before I go, I've got to go. Where's the toilet? I said, down there. So running lads, well, I'm walking to the toilet, and Nikki, who'd been off in the background, just jumps in front of me, and she said, oh, Pete, just before you go, I've, I've just got a question. She was pregnant. And she said, um, this is a kind of thing that happens frequently, and I just want to know why. Uh, she said, this morning when I woke up, there was some, some spotting. I had, I had some, some bleeding um, down there. And, and she said, and I thought, oh, no, I'm going to lose the baby. And she said, the first thing I did is I said, God, why are you doing this to me? She said, so here's my question. Why is it that when anything ever goes wrong in my life, my first thing is to blame God? Now, what do you do when you're already running five minutes late and someone asks you a question like that? You can't ignore a question like that. I've already told them I'm running late. And I said, um, can you just hold that question for a second because I can't hold this anymore. I've got to go to the toilet. So I went to the toilet, I'm standing in the toilet, and I said, Holy Spirit, what do I do now? And the Holy Spirit said back to me, just what you're doing with me. I said, what? Ask a question? Yes. Okay. So I went back, and this is a true story. Julie and I have had this discussion. I said, Nikki, Julie and I have often said that you are the consummate question asker. I said, okay, often you ask it to defer. You don't want to talk about yourself. You want to get us talking, so you do it. But you've also got a counsellor's background. And she goes, yeah, thanks, Pete. That's nice. And I said, so <coughs> I want you to do that of God. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I could give you an answer, but whatever answer I give you is going to be quick, probably glib, and won't be very satisfying. So I said, just trust me on this. Ask the same question you asked of me, of God. Except instead of saying to me, why do I blame God? I say, God, why do I blame you? I said, can you do that? And she goes, seems weird, but yeah, yeah, I think I can. Fast forward six weeks. I'm out running, praying. Holy Spirit, who do you want me to think of? Who do you want me to come to mind? Nikki came to mind. Ring Nikki, goes to voicemail. Six o'clock that night, Ricky, Nikki rings back. And she goes, Pete, is any, everything okay? Anything wrong? I said, no, no, no. I'm just following up from our conversation about six weeks ago. Sorry, I haven't connected before about this. And she goes, oh, my goodness. Haven't I got back to you about that? And I said, no. She said, I gave my testimony last Sunday. I said, really? What was your testimony? She said, well, I, I asked God, just like you told me. She said, I, I asked God. And she said, he answered me. And she said, well, I know he always has been answering me, but I've never recognised. I've never heard his voice before. And I said, what did he say? She said, oh, Nikki, it's because you don't know me. And I said, how did you feel about that? She said, well, I was insulted. So I said back to him, what do you mean, I don't know you? And she said, well, since you've become a Christian, you've learned some facts about me, and you've analysed me, and you've evaluated me, but you don't really know my heart. And Nikki says, well, what does it mean to know your heart? And so the conversation went on, and the conversation finished with the Holy Spirit telling Nikki that it's all about intimacy and not about knowledge. So here's what happened. Nikki asked a question, which led to another 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 question, which led to a place where she was deeper in the Father's heart and the Father's love than she'd ever been before 
but she never got an answer to her original question. It ceased to be of importance the closer she got to his heart. Her hunger was met as she engaged with Holy Spirit and asked questions. Does that take discipline? Well, it doesn't happen automatically. It's not the discipline that takes you to go to the gym, but it does take... You can either sit there and complain, you can sit there and moan, you can sit there and blame the pastor, blame God, that, or you can ask a question. One of my favourite questions, I can't remember which book it's in, I think it's the orange one, is, Father, what is there about you and your heart that I'm missing that has me responding like this? Now, that lady's writing it down. See, I would think, there's another one, right? I would think that everyone would want to write that question down. If I was you, I would be thinking, this bloke who we've brought from South Australia has just said this is the most important question in his life. I would have thought everyone would be writing it down. But you're probably all going to get it on the video. Father, what is there about your you, what is there about you and your heart that I'm missing that has me responding this way? You see, when I find myself getting jealous, when I find myself comparing myself with others, when I find myself blaming Julie, when I find myself that there's, there's obviously something, because I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, there's obviously something about God and his ways that I'm missing that has me responding that way because he doesn't want me to be jealous, he doesn't want me to be angry, he doesn't want me to be blaming Julie. So I ask a question. I don't know what the answer is yet. But through asking the question, we're engaging on a journey. The journey both feeds the hunger, creates the hunger, and it, and it assuages the hunger. I'm glad that Alan has decided to uh, put Julie's elective on twice, not because Julie's the guru, um, but she'll point you to some resources, simply because hearing God's voice is one of the best things we can have in the hunger. Um, I'm not looking at my watch, how are we going? We'll put up a couple of others. Religion or relationship. Religion, you know, um, Julie's mum didn't understand something I wrote in one of my books or an article somewhere because I was poo-pooing religion. And she thinks religion is brilliant. So I had to explain to her that by religion I meant our efforts doing our stuff to try and please God is my definition of religion. Well, God's already pleased with us anyway. He invites us to see ourselves through the same pleasure he sees us. So religion is our efforts, our striving, our earning, our performing. Relationship is where we live in the love that's already his. This is a big one. I haven't got the time to go into it now. But you can ponder it for yourself. Is that how you spell maintain? Maintain or give away. <coughs> when, bless you. When our focus is to maintain, we stagnate. If I said, I want to maintain my fitness, that's okay. I want to maintain my fitness, but I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to push myself. I'll go for a walk, but I won't go for a long walk. Um, I'll have three helpings of dessert. Or whatever. Why? Because I'm just maintaining. As soon as I start to give away, I start to grow. You start to do something for someone else. You develop spiritual muscle. One of the one of the things we've discovered, as we've been helping communities do church outside of the building, is that sometimes some of the people that we end up meeting are people who are reacting to institutional church. The larger the church, the more likely it is that people get burned. And so often because of an orphan spirit, they feel, well, the pastor didn't notice me or my small group leader didn't bring me. But then some of them have just been hurt and they come together and they gather in a small group and all they do in their small group is talk about how bad it was in the past community they were in. Guess what happens? Not only do they not grow, but they actually shrivel. They fester. Because instead of their hunger being filled by a loving God, 
They are feeding their hunger with all the things that First Corinthians, 4, uh, that Ephesians four says, don't. <laughs> you know, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Um, don't speak bad words about others, but use only words that bring grace and build up. Um, put aside malice, slander, wrath, anger, bitterness, and be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Well, when you get together in a Christian group and you practice gossip, slander, malice, unforgiveness, you think you're going to grow? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> it ain't going to happen. But when we start to give away... When we start to gather as four or five people or 40 or 50 people and we say, Father, why have you placed us in the city? Why have you placed us with each other? Why have you given us the gifts that you've given us? Why have you, why have you given us this block of land? And why are these houses being developed around this block of land? Why have you placed me in a small group with these people? I don't even like them. And the Father says, so that you can grow to love them. Ah, oh. and so then he does a work in you. And you partner with the Holy Spirit who's already in you to find out how you can give to there, give to there, give to there, give to there, give to there. When you give away, you become strong. Someone gave me a hug the other week and they said, oh, you're actually quite firm up there. For an old man, it was a backhanded compliment. They said, what, what, do you go to a gym? I said, no, I don't go to a gym. Last year I had six people relying, six families relying on me for firewood. This year I've had to, because we're travelling so much, I've had to cut it down for four. I said, this is just firewood. Oh. So because there are people who I get to give away to, I grow stronger. The same thing happens spiritually. When you see someone in your street who's lonely and you invite them around for a meal, you grow stronger. When you think of someone, when you're out walking or buying the newspaper and you see them across the side of the road and you think, oh, I'm going to ring them. And you get home and you ring them. One hour goes by. Instead of thinking, wow, what a boring phone call, you think, man, I was able to bless someone else today. You grow stronger. It's a great thing. Okay, just a couple more, otherwise you won't have any time in your groups. Two more. Uh, that, that one doesn't really fit. One more. This is an interesting one because I understand what people mean when they use the word desperate or desirous. Some people say, I'm really, I'm, I'm just desperate for God. I'm not desperate for God. Desperation is um, when you're at your wit's end and you've got nothing left. You know, I've got a love-hate relationship with uh, many Christian songs. I know what the song means, but sometimes the word, you know, God, I'm running after you, I'm chasing after you, I'm thinking, uh, if my relationship with God was about how I'm hungering after him and how I'm running after him and how I'm chasing after him, I'm stuffed. But I'm thankful there's a God who runs after me and there's a God who chases after me and there's a God who's... That God is desperate enough for me to send Jesus. That God is desperate enough for me to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Because I'm fickle. And if my relationship with God is measured by my desperation, then I'm stuffed. I'm not always hungry to read my Bible. I'm not always hungry to pray. So I pray for the Holy Spirit to grow in me a desire... And the desire will feed the hunger. And, and you know, here's something I've discovered about myself. If I miss a couple of meals a week, which has rarely happened, by the way, but if, if I miss a couple of meals a week, I don't beat myself up. And I say, oh, Peter, Peter, you, you silly human being. You know, you missed breakfast. Oh, it's useless. It's, it's all finished. You know, you were going to eat breakfast every day and now you don't eat breakfast anymore. I'm just going to give up eating breakfast. No, usually what happens is morning tea's a pick out. So why, what happens in the spiritual world? Why do we beat ourselves up when we miss a quiet time? When we, 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 we apply a rule or a norm to ourselves in the spiritual realm that we don't apply anywhere else in our life. And I invite you today to stop it. To cease and desist beating yourself up for what you haven't done. I've been fasting for seven year, uh, for eight years. And what I've been fasting from are the words, should, 
ought, must, got to, need to, have to. Why? Because they've killed hunger. Things that I found I had to do or thought I should do or thought I must do under coercion in order to be a good Christian because that was what was expected of me killed faith or didn't kill faith. It, it killed joy and dulled faith. But a desire. I would, I, would rather, I would rather read the word once or twice a week. And I'm not saying, this isn't a dumbed down message. This isn't saying revert, but it's a take the pressure off message. Remember, the goal is not, I haven't said this, so here's a new point. The goal is not to read the word every day. The goal is to grow into intimacy with the Father who loves me. A tool for doing that is to read the word regularly. So why don't we be careful we don't confuse the goal and the prize. You know, Paul says in Philippians 3, so forgetting what is behind, I press on toward the goal in order to receive the prize. So the goal is what you can do. The prize is what is gifted. Okay? So we want to grow deeper into the love of the Father. Some steps I can take for that are to read the word every day. The prize is that I find myself growing in intimacy with the Father who loves me. See, I can't create intimacy between Julie and myself. But what I can do is some steps to develop a culture in our marriage where intimacy can flourish. So, with a theme like having a hunger for God, hunger is both a goal and a prize because there are some steps you can take in order to create hunger. But... Hunger is something that's desired and given. It's, it's the circle. You know, it's the chicken and the egg. What comes first? Well, it, it's a mute argument because we start somewhere. And do you know where that somewhere is? It's right where you are now. It's not where the person next to you is. It's not where your husband is or your wife is. It's not where the pastor is or your small group leader is. It's where you are. And it's according to who you are. And it's with the time you've got. So, you know, it may shock some people to find that I listen to the Bible not more than I read it, but as much as I read it these days. Oh, no, you can't listen. You've got to read the Word. And I'm saying, it's the Word of God. Get into it any way you can. You know, we were listening to Bill Johnson on the way out, and Bill Johnson said he gets a Bible verse, and he writes it out, and he takes it with him, and when he drives, he puts it on the windowsill of his car. And when he stops at traffic light, he said, I, by the end of the week, he said, I know that Word off by heart. He said, but I look at it because I like to capture it, and I like to grab its nuances. You know, Bill Johnson, one verse. Wow. If you don't know who Bill Johnson is, Bethel Church, uh, anyway, doesn't matter. So time to get into your groups. They're arranging that themselves. Yep. So you've got some stuff up there.